Thank you very much, Haro. That was really an outstanding lecture, and it was very, very interesting for us. Congratulations to all the great ideas you had in your last years and in over all your whole career. We really like to discuss your lecture now, and as you know, both of us are a bit from the interventional part from endoscopy, and we didn't make ourselves so much thoughts about motility. Um, also, we got to know quite a bit about it since we're doing the poem therapy and the diagnostic and therapy of achalasia. And now we know a bit about the motility and the lower esophageal sphincter, but for sure we are still rookies, and that's why we need some assistance. And we have Mark Fox here from the clinic Alzheim working in Basel before. He did a lot of research on GI motility, and we're very happy to have you here. And on the other hand, we have Jan Borowika from the Kantonsspital St. Gallen, he also did a lot of research on GI motility and introduced the motility center in the Kantonsspital. So that it's, getting not, it, that it's not getting too theoretical, we have invited a surgeon to. This is Paul Schneider, very happy to have you. For sure you're not thinking so much about how your patient burps, but <laughs> for sure you know... For sure. <laughs> for, sure, for sure you know how to select the right patient or the indication for your patients on doing a surgery on a reflux patient. Thank you for coming. I think, Mark, we start with you. Um, Professor Rao also mentioned today your achievements in uh, motility in the London classification, Lyon classification. And my question to you is now, do we need a new method to examine the motility of the esophagus, or are you happy with the uh, high-resolution manometry? So, I mean, I'm, one thing I'm completely in agreement with one thing I'm in is that working? Does it matter? Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so many thanks. It's always amazing to hear how innovative and how forward looking it's been over the last many years. Um, I'm completely in agreement with the future function of GI recently in the endoscopy And there are two reasons. One is that's where gastroenterology loves to be more than anything else. And the other is patient hate test. <laughs> so, but there is, there, there, I mean, there is clearly room for both. But I, I'm actually played with something similar to this that you're describing about 10 years ago with, when I was working with Werner Schuster first of all, and we hadn't, we didn't fully understand them. We didn't have the technology the same way that you had. But I'm completely convinced you're, you're on to something with this flat pattern and the, and the fall off pattern. However, I, I do have a, uh, one or two concerns. The first is we have multiple investigations with high resolution manometry, with endoflip, with and we know, or we think we know, that the LES is really only part of the issue. Yeah? And what, what, what I want to push you on is how confident be with your test as a diagnosis of GERD, or is it simply part of the whole work? I mean, obviously you have sizes, you have, you have symptoms. Our, our, our studies show that LES, there's no one diagnostic method that we use, anometry, end of lip, whatever, gives us all the information that we require. Do you think that takes further forward, or is it still just part of the whole puzzle, like Professor Rao was saying earlier. Yeah, thank you so much. It's a, a great, great point. So uh, I think uh, 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 it's a good suggestion that we have to compare the results of the endoflip that is uh, evaluate uh, this tangent, this tangent of a uh, lower esophageal sphincter. And then uh, our study, so intragastric pressure, Ipsis uh, demonstrate the uh, uh, reactive contraction competency of the lower esophageal sphincter. So uh, maybe a little bit different. So at, at this moment, I have no answer to it. So it's, it's a good suggestion that we have to we have to uh, study uh, the results of uh, and the flip and also Ipsis. I guess what I'm trying to push at is: Is this ever going to be enough to secure the diagnosis? Of no, 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 <laughs> no, no. It's a, it's a. Of course, of course, <laughs> of course. A GERD is a very complicated disease, so uh, it's not simple. But uh, 
as you mentioned, so it's a, a just the first time endoscopy checkup. So we have to do, um, we have to exclude the uh, esophageal cancer, gas leak cancer, so we have to do endoscopy checkup. So at that time, we can get some information more than now. But the question other way around, could you exclude a reflux disease with your method? Uh, no, 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 I don't think so. Mostly, yes. So a typical, typical GERD patient had the uh, flat pattern, but the uh, borderline, borderline cases, it's very difficult to evaluate. So of course, the uh, um, uh, GERD is uh, uh, closely linked to the uh, uh, transient uh, LES relaxation. So maybe I think the night time mostly, I, but so it's a different situation. So I don't think that these studies uh, cover all. I don't think. But, but so far, we never evaluate like, like this. So uh, we can get uh, additional information by this method. I'm, I'm sure it's a, a to do a lot of information that we take a lot of time and effort to do other ways. Um, the, uh, the, one, uh, the, the other point I, was, I had jotted down was one thing that one can't investigate understation. Mm -hmm. And so and of course the, in the functional GI lab, atypical is typical, as I'm sure Jonas would agree. You know, most of the people that we see haven't responded to TPIs have unusual symptoms. I was talking to Paul yesterday about laryngopharyngeal reflux and complex cases. You need to build a case, don't you? Uh, but I think one work that I'm most impressed. Again, a question with the LES, with the scope holding sign. So you are sure that uh, what we see during the insufflation, this contraction, is the LES? Mm -hmm. Once you mentioned that this can move also more up, is it then really the LES? Uh -huh. or uh -huh. So uh, thank you very much. It's uh, another uh, interesting point. So uh, of course, you know that some GERD patient had the uh, erosion. It's a mostly uh, a linear erosion starting from uh, so far gas with junction and the uh, moving upward. So my question was, is, so, uh, so for the difference, uh, long erosion and the very short. So uh, for example, Los Angeles A and B, the erosion is uh, located just the distal esophagus, but some patient grade C, D that are going up to the uh, high. So for the difference, so it's a quite interesting. Uh, today we have a limited ti time, so I, I don't show the case. But uh, in a little flex, and then so in separate the stomach. So in the case of a grade A and B uh, Los Angeles uh, erosion, it's a scope holding sign located at the level, original level, close to. And in the case of a long erosion, it's a scope holding sign is going up. So maybe I think, so after losing the LES uh, normal contraction, so it's up to body, <coughs> replace, it work. So try to avoid um, going up the uh, reflux, uh, reflux fluid. So <laughs> that is a le the just a hypothesis, but uh, some patients, is, uh, we can uh, understand what's happened in this patient, in each patient. So ju just a hypothesis. There's, there's no a, evidence, no evidence. There, there, is, there is indeed evidence that the esophageal cone responds to the reflux to try and protect itself. Of course, that would be most important in where the LES is not. Paul, I think you had a comment on that. Yeah, I, I, thank you. Thank you so much. I have a lot of questions, <laughs> but I, I'm sure I cannot ask them all. I'm very convinced, uh, Haru, that uh, adds a deeper information. It's not the complete. I don't think it's efficient because, uh, even I have to tell you, all your friends are dead. So you cannot answer all the questions because they're all those reflux patients. Those patients have cancer. There are so many, many different patients that. Even you, with all your fancy tests, cannot answer. <laughs> and I'm sure that he can add uh, a bit uh, more information 
uh, to that. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, some more specific questions with your three centimeter rule in, in the actual deviation. I mean, first of all, um, you know that, uh, I mean, I observed this many times, you know, I have a esophagogram and I have an endoscopy. And there's a huge difference because the endoscopist describes a huge hernia and the radiologist describes almost no hernia. He attempts to describe a hernia because he knows that the gastroenterologist described a huge hernia. So, to, 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 well, so, so, so what about this, uh, this three centimeter rule? Do you, can you comment on that? Yeah, yeah, so uh, the, I, I think, uh, I, 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 I have no idea the uh, radiologist uh, diagnosis, but, but so um, endoscopically and, and so we can identify the junction and the scum columnar junction as well, EGJ, and the uh, uh, hiatus, uh, we anatomically we can very well uh, recognize. So that's the reason why, so endoscopists, uh, they can catch more and more small hiatal hernia. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you're right because, uh, because uh, when the radiologist describes no hernia and, uh, and uh, the endoscopist describes the hernia, there is a hernia. Uh, yeah, when you operate on them, you, you can see. They are small. They are less than uh, three centimeters, <coughs> but, they are, but they are there. But one, one thing maybe you can answer and you can answer uh, is uh, you, we get these patients. Otmar, you, uh, I'm sure you have seen them too. Uh, uh, we get these patients, they have reflux disease, you know, we have your uh, um, pH metry, and it's clear they have a Demister score of uh, 30, they have some more or less uh, uh, positive symptom association, and then I look at the manometry, manometry is, uh, is, uh, is a big black box many times, and then I, s I always look, I don't look at the fancy propulsive patterns and so on, but I look at the lower esophageal sphincter pressure, and then there is a regular, normal, lower esophageal sphincter. So do, do you think, do you think that, uh, because this is also only, uh, uh, you know, a small time period where you, where you observe, do you think you can even uh, better uh, uh, discriminate uh, a lower sphincter dysfunction? in some of those patients than uh, manometry? Uh, so <laughs> it's it is uh, just a provocation. Not a mouth center study that we don't organize, so not yet. So um, I think my impression that uh, um, we, can, we, can, we can observe simply the contraction of the LES and then the release of the gas as a burping. So, that's a part, part we can see. Yeah, so it's a very simple, very simple. And then uh, we, have to, uh, we have to continue the, uh, I think, uh, uh, together with our manometry, and then uh, fat happen, fat happen, so precisely. And like I said, I think that uh, any one measurement of lower esophageal sphincter function not adequate to diagnose reflux disease. And the Leon consensus is indeed that we effectively continue to do investigations until we're sure that we know what's going on. And I think this is appropriate. In medicine, that's what we do all the time. If you're not clear about the diagnosis, then you do another test, or perhaps you just follow up a few weeks later. So I think you know every, anything that adds to the pattern is really helpful. Yeah. I just won't make similar remarks, but I think that the main problem of this system, I, I, I agree on you, it's a perfect uh, observation, but the main problem is that it's not standardized, it's, it's qualitative, it's not, we can't uh, make a quantification because the millimeter mercury you measure are not in a barostat, so you, you're not sure about the volume in your stomach, and it has nothing to do with uh, food ingestion, so as, as we know, in, if you put intraduodenal uh, fats in, uh, in a patient, you will have a fundic relaxation. You will, belching is a normal phenomenon after eating because 
we decrease the intergastric pressure actually. So, and the real reflux problems comes one and a half hour after eating. So I'm not sure that this is physiology what we're looking at. It's just a distension phenomenon of the lower esophageal sphincter, but we don't know what happens actually when the patient is eating. So that's why we need the symptoms. We need the whole story behind and, and the intragastric uh, air insufflation might be a hint, but uh, certainly it's not a physiologic test. That's true, but I think yeah. he said very nicely, it's a provocation test. Yeah, I, yeah. I agree, yeah. but uh, we have stopped with provocation tests uh, for spasms. We did prostigmine, we did a lot of uh, simulation tests. We ingested uh, acids to see if, if it hurts. So I'm, I think it's, it's good, you know, but I'm not sure that we, we get a step further. Yeah, thank you very much. It's, uh, about it's my opinion. Yeah, yeah, great comment. I, I think so. Uh, we have discussed uh, uh, in our uh, institute that the, uh, so when uh, we insufflate in the stomach, so the gas, so we, we insufflate the CO2. So gas is going down to the uh, duodenum and the, and the small intestine, maybe. But so uh, for, uh, we, we have to discuss another discussion of the functional dyspepsia in the case. <laughs> so yeah. another discussion. Yeah. But, but so most of the case, um, um, so uh, if we insufflate in the stomach, it's a upper GI endoscopy examination anytime so that we can get the uh, uh, insufflation in the stomach. So that the uh, leakage uh, to the duodenal side is not much, I think, but we have to discuss uh, particularly, particularly in the patient of a functional dyspepsia. Or maybe we can jump to another topic because uh, you one, 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 one question <laughs> from a surgeon's point of view, be allowed, because uh, uh, this is this belching sign. You know, we have uh, the anti-belching uh, problem sometimes after surgery uh, with the gas bloating uh, symptom. So, d could you imagine to discriminate uh, or, or to 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 foresee patients who have uh, severe uh, gastric bloating? Uh, after surgery. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a, it's a very nice question. So, uh, Dr. Schneider, uh, uh, as he mentioned, that there are some patients who receive the uh, um, anti-reflux procedure, uh, sometimes at all, sometimes the uh, um, toupee and the Nissen fund application. Some patients also become the uh, gas blow syndrome, so too tight Nissen. So at the time, so this, this examination works very well. Very well. Yeah. <laughs> I think from time wise, you have to say, <laughs> because you mentioned the arms armor, very interesting procedure, and we don't do it yet. But the question is do we need it? You said we need it for people that don't react good on the PPI therapy and maybe are not candidates for reflux surgery yet. Question to all of you Do you think it's necessary to have such a procedure, Jan? Uh, I, I think it's a very interesting procedure. I'm just not sure if, if you you attack the mucosa and the problem is in the muscle. So I'm not. It it the, your data look wonderful and maybe it works and the selection will be the problem because we know that the the, the size of the hiatal hernia varies and you have to be sure that the the patient. Uh, is not the gap maybe somewhere else we, we don't know if he's doing very well on a single dose ppi we don't have to do uh, armor but if he is not doing well on double dose ppi armor is not enough so we have to find the right patients i think that's the problem all from your side uh, yeah i think uh, it's a it's a, it's a problem of uh, of the selection uh, and I'm quite sure or quite confident that it is for a, a particular subgroup of patients, probably, you know, nerd patients uh, with a little reflux unresponsive to PPI. Because you see in, in the same way when you, when you see uh, high frequency fundoplication countries like, for instance, uh, Australia, uh, you can see that for these patients, uh, the, the degree of the fundoplication is going down. And in Australasia, they have currently a study for NERD patients with a 90 degree, just a, just a tiny little uh, flap. So I would think 
that uh, for, for those patients who are anyway no good candidates for surgery, you can achieve a lot because they still suffer. We should not forget because as a surgeon, then you often say, oh, uh, these, uh, these patients, no, they get out of my, my, uh, my, my practice. But uh, another question uh, for you concerning these arms, and I think it's for a different population, is a difference in the strategy. Because surgery is now, as you do a subcardial mucosectomy, so this is a subcardial strategy. Uh, this is uh, uh, completely different to surgery, which is an epicardial, supracardial strategy. Because if you make the fundoplication at the level of the cardia or below, you have a problem with, uh, with uh, dysphagia. So uh, just from, from seeing this diff very, very different approach, I would think that it's, it, it, it becomes at least logical to me that this procedure is for some patients, but for sure, uh, but, but not for heavy reflux, volume reflux or something like yes, that. Yes, so thank you very much. It's a very, very important uh, uh, point. So uh, in a uh, laparoscopic surgery uh, to pay or missing fund application, the fund application is uh, located at the level of our uh, abdominal esophagus, not in the gastric cardia. So uh, that is the uh, uh, anatomically uh, the right place, so surgery, fund application, surgical fund application is a place in the right place. So it's a it's the same level of the lower esophageal sphincter. So I think the surgical procedure is, a, I, at this moment, a perfect procedure. So uh, compared to that, so armor, armor procedure is, in a, as you mentioned, we place the uh, ablation in a gastric cardia, top of the uh, yeah, doom of the uh, gastric cardia. So it's uh, totally different from the uh, lower esophageal sphincter. So, but, so in, in our uh, pilot study, so we place the uh, uh, ulceration in a uh, level of the uh, LES. The patient becomes the uh, temporary stricture. Uh, some patients uh, uh, need, uh, needed a uh, couple of uh, balloon dilation after therapy. So uh, in order to avoid that, finally we um, going down and down, and finally we lead to the gastric cardiac. So totally different procedure, anatomically. Yeah. You're right. So the last question. <laughs> are, are you not simply creating a narrowing, a, a, a relative narrowing of, of, of those stenosis? It's not really replacing the uh, flap valve. It's simply mechanically making it narrower. And as we all know, the relationship of flow to diameter is extremely to a power of four, it should be, and it, and it clearly is in your hands, very effective. Uh, am I right in thinking that way, or, or do you really think you're having an effect on, on function? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, also a very, very extremely important point, and I realize, I realize, so arms and the armor procedure is uh, just making the uh, lumen narrow. That's all. So. Do not, uh, maybe we cannot expect reducing the, uh, uh, um, um, we cannot reduce the uh, number of reflux. We cannot, same, same number. But the volume, total volume of the reflux, reflux, refluxate reduced. That's a mechanism. So not a 100% uh, effect, but so so. Better than nothing. <laughs> so we are at an end of an outstanding session, and how we want to thank you. You showed very nicely with abscess the flat pattern and the uphill pattern. We are here in Switzerland, and I think the therapeutic goal is to get the uphill pattern. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>